Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Hello and welcome everyone. Prior to the open session, council met for a brief close meeting. I moved by Councillor McCann and second by Councillor Borneman that pursuant to section 2392 and 3 of the Municipal Act SO 2001 C25 as amended, Council of the Corporation of the Town of Perry Sound moves to a meeting closed to the public in order to address a matter matters pertaining to E litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality of local or local board claim against the municipality. F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, agreement for services, claim against the municipality. And N, educating or training council members and no member discusses or otherwise deals with any matter in a way that materially advances the business or decision making of council regarding water and wastewater rate structures. There he is. Next is the agenda. Are there any additions or prioritizations to the agenda? Can I have a mover and a seconder, please, uh, for the adoption? Uh, Councillor Keith and Councillor Borneman that the uh, council agenda for March 3rd 2020 be approved as circulated all in favor carried um, uh, are there any pecuniary interest or the nature thereof um, I will be declaring a pecuniary interest uh, with regards to item 8.1. I receive remuneration from one of the organizations that we um, listed uh, to send a letter to. Okay. We will now begin the public meeting. Just to uh, inform everybody that we are now going to take a few minutes to hold a public meeting to hear any interested persons with regard to a proposed zoning bylaw amendment under section 34 of the Planning Act. Uh, can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor McCann and Councillor Borneman, that we do now adjourn the regular meeting and declare the public meeting open. Ms. Johnson, could you explain how the public was notified of the zoning bylaw amendment Z-20-01, additional unit amendment, Town of Perry Sound? Yes, notice was given by prepaid first class mail to the required prescribed agencies posted in the newspaper and was placed on the town's website. Thank you. Uh, Mr. LG, could you explain the purpose of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment? Certainly. The town is proposing to amend the zoning bylaw to permit secondary units within single detached, semi detached, and townhouse dwelling units as well as within ancillary units such as garages uh, to these. Uh, this is following the provincial direction as per section 16.3 of the Planning Act. Uh, this is a town-wide initiative that applies to all residential zones. Does anyone wish to speak in favor of this proposed zoning bylaw amendment? No. Um, does anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposed zoning bylaw amendment? No. Thank you. Uh, Mr. LG, have there been any letters received as a result of this notice? No, there has not. Thank you. 
the public should contact staff or check the town's website to see when this amendment will come back for a decision. Council, at its discretion, may approve the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. If so, it must either circulate notice of passing of the bylaw or give notice in the local press. Objections to the passing of the bylaw will be received by the clerk within 20 days from the date such notice is given. Which, object, which objections will be forwarded to the local planning appeal tribunal if an appeal is submitted and the appellant has not provided counsel with an oral or written submission before the passing of the bylaw, the local planning appeal tribunal may choose to dismiss this appeal. Thank you. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Motion. Councillor McCann. And a seconder. Councillor Keefe. That we do now declare the public meeting closed. All in favor? Carried. Okay. Okay, adoption of the minutes. Um, can I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Borneman and Councillor McCann, that the minutes from the regular council meeting held February 18, 2020 be approved as circulated. All in favor? Carried. And can I have a this one too? Mm -hmm. mover and a seconder for the February 27th minutes of the special council budget meeting? Councillor McCann and Councillor Keith, that the minutes from the special council budget meeting held February 27, 2020, be approved as circulated. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Okay. 3.2 questions to staff. Are there any questions to staff? We'll start with Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you. This is for Mr. Kearns. Um, a couple of, uh, I guess last week, I forget just what day it was, uh, I believe we had a water main break on Cedar Street. And uh, uh, from the uh, appearance of, uh, of the, uh, I, I guess, the gravel and such out there, it looks like that's a problematic area. Can you, can you speak to that, if indeed there is a problem there? <laughs> Certainly, uh, through you, Madam Deputy, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so there were, in fact, in the same area, two water main breaks within two weeks, uh, or very close together. Um, not uncommon in particularly cold weather, given the type of pipe that is in the ground. I'm not aware um, that there's a particular issue in that area. Um, it may have something to do with the way in which uh, the pipe was originally installed. It's a cast iron main. Um, they are not very uh, flexible. They're very brittle pipe. So if they are exposed to any movement through frost, heaving, that sort of thing, um, they will crack, essentially. Uh, and I think that's what our staff experienced. So both were repaired very quickly, uh, but not aware of a particular um, concentrated issue in the area. Staff did a good job in getting it repaired uh, rather quickly. Living over in that area, there, it's uh, we take for granted uh, our our resources, our ser services until they're not there. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Borneman. Uh, 
through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, I've, I'm, I'm well aware of both of those intersections, uh, and, and you know, from a personal perspective, uh, the new one at Isabella and uh, Gibson is well signed. Um, you know, the lights are, are very apparent. Um, you know, it's it's hard to miss them. Unfortunately, um, sometimes driver habits are uh, more a, a symptom of society, perhaps. Um, I think it becomes difficult with stop signs in particular. And, uh, you know, we're looking at some different options through um, some of our budget discussions in terms of, of traffic control and traffic calming. Um, however, stop signs are problematic um, in that my understanding is in order to enforce, someone will have to witness it. Um, you know, whereas red light cameras are something that are being explored more and more. Um, that's a problem as far as a stop sign goes though, because that's not, um, it's not tied to the signalization of the lights. Um, and there's some uh, uncertainty as to the admissibility of video evidence. And certainly I think, you know, from an enforcement standpoint, and I'm certainly not the, the expert um, from that standpoint, but I do know that um, when they do go to court, uh, there is a decision made um, at that point. So that's something that's beyond our control. Uh, I think that we, our best efforts are made in education uh, and through the public and trying to bring awareness to the uh, how important it is to maintain safety at those crosswalks for all the users. Any further questions? Thank you. Councillor Keith. Well, I would just like to ask Mr. Cairns, do you think the idea of, in reference to education, if we uh, also add that to the next sound newsletter and also on the website, we need to be promoting education and the importance of the stop signs because uh, I think those those intersections are really it's quite clear you need to be paying attention to your driving but education do you see that is maybe something that can be prioritized a little bit more certainly through you madam deputy mayor um, absolutely uh, we have the means to to get messages out <clears throat> excuse me um, rather economically and I think, you know, perhaps in discussions with our policing partners, there's some options there. Perhaps they have some um, suggestions to us to how to better get that message out. Any further questions to staff? Okay, uh, deputations. Uh, we have two deputations tonight, and our first deputation is Sergeants Withrow and McDonald regarding the OPP billing model. Welcome. Please, please turn the microphone. Thank you, everyone. So my name is Kelly Withrow. I am a sergeant with the OPP Municipal Policing Bureau, and I am a municipal policing specialist with the OPP. And with me, I'm sure you all know, Staff Sergeant Jeremy McDonald, Detachment Commander. So I have been asked here tonight to speak about the OPP billing model. So... When I speak about the OPP billing model, I like to speak from the top down. So the provincial government provides the OPP with a provincial policing budget of $1.174 billion. So 64% of that is provincial responsibility and 35% of that is municipal policing resource. So the 64% accounts for $752 million of that cost recovery of the $1.174 billion. And 34%, or $409 million, accounts for municipal policing resources. So the 64% is provided at no cost recovery to the municipality, and the 35% is where we do the cost recovery. So if I go in depth in each section of this, so the 64%, which is the provincial responsibility, which is provided to the municipalities by the OPP at no cost recovery, it includes things such as traffic safety, so that's our aircraft, 
um, our traffic safety program, we have our snowmobiles, we have our marine unit. It also includes investigations, so our criminal investigations, so um, our homicide. Child sexual exploitation, so um, any sort of child sex crimes. Any rackets is our fraud. Organized crime and investigation and support, all provided at no cost recovery. It also includes our intelligence, so our covert operations, so this is our undercover. Um, anything anti-terrorism, analysis and information, our field intelligence. We have our specialized re response team, so this is our emergency medical services, our aviation, so the canine unit. We have our ERT team, anything negotiation and our tactics of um, search and rescue. Uh, we also have our auxiliary, community safety, unincorporated territory, and indigenous policing. So all of these provincial resources are provided to your municipality by the OPP at no cost recovery. So we now have the 35%. So this is your $409 million. So this is municipal resources. So this is what is provided to the municipality by the OPP at a cost recovery, which means that the OPP needs to recover $409 million from all of the municipalities that it polices and provide it back to the provincial government. So what is included in here? It's our detachment staff, so supervision. So you have your detachment commanders, your staff sergeant, your inspectors. You have your frontline constables. You have your civilian administrative and support at the detachment. You also have support positions such as communication operators, so your dispatch your prison guards, your provincial police academy, so any of our new recruits coming through. You have your in-service training, so every one of us as police officers, we have to do in-service training every year to requalify. that's a part of it. Municipal Policing Bureau, which is what I'm a part of, quality insurance um, to make sure adequacy standards are met. We have our forensic identification, we have IT at our regional headquarters. So. All of those are municipal responsibilities, and that's where we recover the $409 million. So how do we recover the $409 million from municipalities? It's what we call the OPP billing model. So if I start from the beginning of where the OPP billing model came from, so back in 2012, the Auditor General was receiving a number of complaints from municipalities, and what they were saying was, the old model, it was confusing, they didn't understand it. Some municipalities were paying um, like $35 per property, some were paying all the way up to $895 per property. So the Auditor General said, okay, I will form a team and I'll take a look. So after some sessions with this team, they took a look at the model and they said, yep, you're right, it doesn't, it's not transparent, it's not fair. So they went to the OPP with some recommendations. So what they said was three main recommendations. We need you to create a new billing model. We need it to be fair and transparent. And we need you to address the varying differences in the property so that it's more lateral. So what the OPP did from 2012 all the way to 2015 is we created this new billing model. And in creating it, we had um, engagement sessions with the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Service, um, MPACT, municipal associations, Police Service Act, all of these, all the municipalities. And we had engagement sessions to see what they need and what they see this new billing model to be. So the way that we address the fairness and transparency is this new billing model, as you can see on the far left of this slide, this was prior to the billing model in 2014, you can see the variances in prices where some municipalities were paying super low and some were paying super high. So you can see starting from 2015, it's more lateral, it's more even. On the other side, transparency. So what we do is we go to conferences. So as a member of the Municipal Policing Bureau, we go to AMO, we go to Roma, we talk with municipalities, we talk about the billing model, anything that you need there. We do annual webinars. Uh, we send out call for service billing summary reports every year. We go to meetings such as this where we talk about the billing model and we answer some questions that you may have on it. And uh, opp.ca is available to anybody that they can go on and they can get every document that we need. It has the billing model, it has annual billing statements, anything that you need um, in relation to your municipality is on that website. So. 
If we now take a look at the OPP billing model, so this pyramid here is the first slide that you saw where we dealt with the provincial budget. So this is the actual 35%. So on the first slide, it actually said $4.9 million needs to be recovered. Well, that was a 2019 reconciled number. So this is your 2020 estimated recovery. So what we expect it to be is $411 million for 2020. So if we break down what is included in the billing model, it's broken down into three categories. So you have your base services, your calls for service, and your other costs. So your base service accounts for $210 million of the recovery of the 411. You then have your calls for service, which accounts for $162 million of the cost recovery. And then other costs, which uh, I'll get into, which accounts for $38 million for a total cost recovery of $411 million from the municipalities. So what is here is your, you've probably all seen it, but it's your 2020 estimated base service and calls for service summary. So this tells you where we come up with that 210 million for base services and 162 million for calls for service. So if you take a look at the top here, so right there, your base service, if you add all of that down, that tells you exactly where it's coming from. Add it all down, you will see here, I can't see that but to, I assume it says 210 million. So that is your cost recovery. So your calls for service, if you add all of that up, it should equal to $162 million. So if you add those two up, you divide it by the 1,150,000 properties that the OPP police, you come up with your base cost per property, which is 183.23. So let me now get into each one of those more in depth. So your base service is on a per property cost. So it's 183.23. Every property across Ontario that we police pays that. Your calls for service is on your municipality's usage and then additional costs, there's five. So there's overtime, court security, accommodations and cleaning, enhancement, and prisoner transportation. So if I go into each one separately. So your base service, what it is, is it's your proactive policing. So this is to say that you have an officer in your community 24-7 if you need them. So this is, accounts for your crime prevention, uh, your proactive, so this is directed patrols. Um, this is to train the officers, make sure they're all trained up and ready to go and administrative duties. So this accounts, as I said, for $210 million. So the OPP right now police 326 municipalities across the province. And in that 326 municipalities, there's over 1,150,000 properties. So every property, all 1,150,000 properties will pay this base service of 183.23, okay? So your calls for service, so this is going to be different for every municipality. So if you think of this as a big pot of money, so $162 million is in this big pot. And this needs to be recovered back to the provincial government. So how do we recover it? Well, we go through every municipality's calls for service and we determine what your usage percentage is. So what does your municipality take from that? What do you owe as a part of that? So the way in which we do this is we take your calls for service every year for four years and we take an average. And the reason that we take an average is because sometimes municipalities have spikes and valleys. So if you have a major call in a year, you're going to really spike and that could really affect your municipality for that pay period. So we do an average to make sure that it's more even. So what happens here, and what you're seeing here, is your billable calls for service. So every call that comes in, so this is actually somebody in your municipality picking up the phone and calling the police and saying, I have an assault to report, I have a break and enter, I have a mischief, whatever the case is, this is actually someone picking up and calling. Every single one of your calls that come in to the police are put into a billable call for service category. And these are our nine categories that we bill for. So if a call comes in and it's not part of this category, you're not billed for it. 
Okay? So what we do is we take all of the calls for service across the province and we figure out a time standard. And what the time standard is, is you can see it to the far right, your average time standard for each of the billable calls for service. We then determine what your call for service is and we multiply it by the time standard and we figure out your percentage of that pot of the $162 million. Okay, it might make more sense when we actually look at yours. So the additional cost. So this is the $38 million that needs to be recovered. So as I said, there's five things. There's overtime, court security, prisoner transportation, accommodation and cleaning, and enhancements. So overtime is simple. If your municipality, if your officers in your municipality accumulate overtime, you pay for it. For court security, only municipalities who have a court in their municipality pay and they have to pay for the court security. It's their responsibility. Prisoner transportation is on a per property basis. So as I said, the OPP polices 1,150,000 properties. Every single property pays $1.99 for prisoner transportation. And the reason for that is because every municipality needs prisoner transportation, whether it's to transport a prisoner to court, whether it's to transport them to a correctional facility, everyone requires it. Um, accommodation and cleaning, you only pay accommodation and cleaning if the OPP provide the accommodation and cleaning. So if you as your municipality have provided the accommodation and you contract out your own cleaning, you don't pay for it. But if you rely on the OPP to do it, then we cost on a per property basis, again, at $4.78. Okay? Now enhancements. Enhancements are a dedicated officer. So if you decide as a municipality you have a school and you want one officer in that school Monday to Friday, 8 to 4, no questions asked, you can have it, but you will pay for it 100%. Okay, it's not expected that other municipalities will pay for your enhancements. Okay, so this is your front sheet of your 2020 annual billing statement. So as you can see, see the top section here? This is your base service. Okay, so what this tells me is that you have 3,428 properties. Now the OPP gets that property count from MPAC. So because our cost per property for 2020 is 183.23, all we do is multiply it by your property count to come up with your total cost of 628,117. Okay, that's a simple calculation. Now your calls for service is a little more complicated because what you can see here is that $162 million that needs to be recovered and what it's saying is that your percentage is 0.8% of that $162 million, which I can't which you can see we actually bring it down to a per property cost, but it's a total cost of 1,318,164 of that $162 million cost recovery. Now, your overtime. So what this snapshot tells me is that you have accumulated um, or will be expected to accumulate almost $60,000 in overtime. It tells me that because you're paying court security, you have a court in your municipality, so you will be paying court security. That comes to $135,000 for 2020. Prisoner transportation, as I said, it's $1.99 per property, so that's a simple calculation of 199 times your property count to come up with the 6800 your accommodation and cleaning, the fact that this is on it for $4.78 tells me that we provide your accommodation and your cleaning, so you pay for it, and it's $16,000 for a total estimated cost of $2.1 million. So the year-end adjustment. So what this is saying is, because this is a 2020, this is an estimate. This is what we expect it to be for 2020. So if at the end of the year we determine that we have overestimated or underestimated, then that is provided back to you. So what this is telling me in 2018 is we overestimated. So we gave you back $75,000. So as you can see, it's now down to 2 million. We divide that by 12 months. 
for $174,000 a month. That's owed. Now, with all of this said and done, the billing model, what it does for us is it provides adequacy standards. So the Police Service Act requires that the OPP provide every municipality that they police, so all 326 municipalities with um, adequacy standards. So what that entails is crime prevention, law enforcement, assistance to victims, public order unit, and emergency response. So it makes sure that we meet adequacy standards. As I talked about, the year-end adjustment, every year, because these are estimates, we go back, we reconcile, and we either provide it back to you in an increase or a decrease. And then what this tells you is your annual billing comparison from 2015 when the OPP billing model was implemented until now. So as you can see, it is for 2020, the cost recovery, $411 million. Your average cost per property for the OPP is 358, and base service cost is 183.23. And as you can see, it has slowly been going down every year. And the reason for this is because we keep taking on other municipalities. So, the more municipalities that we start policing, the more properties we start policing, and the more um, that they start paying as well. So, your cost is going to be going down. Um, and. Yeah, so as you can see, your municipality property count from MPAC is going up, which is the whole reason why the base service cost can go down. So that is it in general. Um, but what I can do is show you your annual billing statement and your calls for service if you want to see how we calculate your percentage. Uh, please do. Yes, yeah? okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so what that is showing me is exactly what I just went through with you, but what I'm going to show you is your calls for service. So this is Perry Sounds. So what it's telling me is every single year, you can see in 2015, you can see 16, 17, and 18, how many calls that you had in each billable call for service category. So you can see if you're going up, you can see if you're going down, you can see if you're staying even. We then do a four-year rolling average, as I said. So these here are the four-year average. This is the average time standard, so we just uh, multiply them by each other for the total weighted time over here. So then we then compare it to the overall calls for service for every municipality, what it is, and we take your percentage from that. So you can see what your percentage is here for every single one of the nine broken down billable calls for service categories and how we came up with your 0.8% of the $162 million. Thank you. Clear? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Councillor yes. Keith. Yes, madam. Maybe you could just uh, explain to councillor or the public, uh, say there's uh, three offences that occur basically about the same time in the same vicinity. In, uh, are we actually billed for each one or is there actually a lumping together? Okay, so how it works is, say for example, let's take a break and enter, for example. So if a break and enter comes in um, and we know that a house has been broken into. So that's one call for service. If then the OPP go out and they go around and they do some directed patrol and they notice that 20 properties have been broken into, that's still only one call, okay? But if you have 10 different people calling in as a calls for service for a break and enter, then yes, it's going to be 10 different calls. Follow up. Yes. Just for one other question, um, can you explain about the role of um, the individual now being able to use the computer and to re report 
some yeah. of the offenses and it ha is that does that affect our billing model can you explain that it does so what we have now gotten into is online reporting so online reporting does not count as a call for service so it's just a different way for us to assist municipalities in reducing their calls for service and to um, increase community engagement. So it all actually came about because of 911 calls, especially with hangups, because a lot of municipalities received, were receiving a ton of hangups and they were counting as one call for service every single time. So as you can see, it would go with an average time standard 1.3 because it's under an operational two call if you look up there. So every single time a 911 hang up, drop, call, whatever the case, you're being charged at that price at 1.3 time standards. So that came into effect because of that in a way to reduce it. So um, just in order to improve our relationship with municipalities, what we did is we did the online reporting and they do not count as a call for service. Councillor McKen. Yes, thank you for your report. Um, just based on what uh, Councillor Keith was asking, uh, if you get a call for service, and I think I understand what you're saying, um, and, and you respond to, say, a, a residence, and, and there's been a break and enter, but maybe there's been an assault as well, and maybe a theft, so maybe like three different, uh, 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 you know, occurrences that, uh, in that one particular call. Does that is that one charge, or is it three one separate call. ones? One call. So one call. Yeah. So what happens is the initial call comes in, and it depends on how the officer clears it. So they clear it as um, the highest priority call in your UCR, and that's what it's reported as. So it's one call. Thank you. Uh, can I second question? Yeah. Well, when, when you were talking about uh, if, if, if you overbuild, it, um, I, I, think, I think you did say something, but I, I think I might have missed it. Uh, do we just get that in the form of a credit in the next year yes. and vice versa if if we're short that it's added to our our next year's billing then like there's no cash refund or there's anything. no actual money exchange it does go on your billing yeah okay, thank you yeah you're welcome councillor Borneman did you have a question yeah. and I'll start by saying I recognize that you're the messenger not the uh, the the uh, maybe the people that uh, devise this system. When I look at that chart of where the, you know, the charges on page five of 20, can you tell me what operational and operational two are? Because they're sure. the, by far the two largest uh, call generators uh, of, of your- uh, Absolutely. Of your Yep, so if you keep scrolling down, you will see uh, every single one of your calls for service, what is included in it. So keep going down to page 7 of 20, and that starts with the first one being drug possession, then you have drugs, then you have operational, it, include, it lets you know okay. every single one of the calls that are included, and then it goes to operational 2 below. So this is just the bookkeeping and itemization? Yep. Thing. It tells you exactly what it is. So operational two, obviously, if you can see from it, it's your 911 calls, your drop calls, hangups, your false alarms, and keep the peace. So that's what's under operational two. Okay. Uh, on page 17, when we're breaking down costs, you caught my attention when you said that every property in the province pays mm -hmm. for prisoner transfer, mm -hmm. yet only those communities that have a court pay for court security and accommodation and such. Um, and again, as I said, I recognize that you folks don't make the rules here, that someone else devised the system, but it, it does beg the question of fairness. You know, not all of those court prisoners, uh, not all of the dirt is, is arrived at from citizens in Perry Sound. Uh, certainly not all of the security is arrived at for uh, citizens from Perry Sound that, uh, and it begs the question why those costs aren't incurred on a, an equal basis, the yeah. same as transportation is. And as, as I said, I get it that you guys aren't the ones who uh, do this, but it, it, uh, it, it does beg that question for uh, those of us who were tagged with those costs. And I think it's important <laughs> 
you know, it's been pretty consistent, uh, 580 odd dollars, $590 uh, to a tax bill in this community is for policing. It's by far the largest single cost that uh, Perry Sound incurs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so as I say, I think in fairness, uh, some of those questions need to be answered. Right. Did you want, would you like me to respond to that? Or is it just a blanket? Well, as I say, I don't expect Yeah, to I, I don't, you're right. Yeah, absolutely. So I totally understand that and I get the concern for sure. Unfortunately, that is the only way that they can see it work. So for example, um, if you have a court in your municipality, you pay for it. It's the same as a school. So if you have a school in your municipality, like a high school, like a huge high school, and it accumulates a ton of calls for service, even though there's a ton of people from outside, a ton of students from outside your municipality attending that school, they are responsible for it. And I understand the unfairness in it, absolutely, but that is the way that they have figured out, the only way that they figured out. But, okay, let me also add that there is grants. Okay, so there is um, court security grants that are provided, and it's provided by the um, Solicitor General, and it is provided by us two times a year, so in February and in October. And I think, if I just off the top of my head, I think it was like $25 million for this year that is recovered that municipalities get a portion of. Councillor McCann? Just curious, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, when you talk about court security, are we talking provincial offenses as well as uh, as well as provincial court? Uh, yes. Downtown? Yes. Any further questions? Well, thank you very much. That was very thank informative. You. Good. Thank you. Our second deputation tonight, uh, 5.2, is David Sweetnam, Executive Director, Georgian Bay Forever, uh, to give a Georgian Bay Forever update and request for support for CBINS. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here again in front of you. Um, I guess it was about a year and a bit ago that we sat down and asked for some, or two years ago, that we asked for council to consider supporting the microfibers uh, project with a letter of support for our application, which, as you know, we were successful in. And I have some preliminary numbers, uh, figures, that I thought I would share with you uh, this evening. Um, while as scientists we like to have uh, multiple points of, uh, of data to kind of amass and make conclusions from, I'm not going to make all the conclusions, I'll just kind of give you the uh, initial point uh, of data collection that we've got. So the, the first thing we did was we set out to install filters in 100 households, uh, which we've now accomplished. And we are, in fact, expanding the program out to install an additional 100 filters into households in the town. So that'll make a total of 200. Um, but at the time, we did the first collection of the fibers that had been uh, trapped by the filters. We only had 70 households online. So that's why the first collection was only from 70 volunteer households that we got out to. And from those, we diverted seven kilograms of fibers. And I know seven kilograms doesn't really sound like that much, but this is fluff. Seven kilograms of fluff is a lot of fluff, right? A lot of stuff. Anyway. So uh, in that, there are about three million microfibers that we 
uh, were able to assay out at the University of Toronto. That's a lot of microfibers that are not getting into Georgian Bay because they're being trapped at the point of the uh, washing machine. So that was kind of good news and it showed that the filters in fact could trap the fibers and were working. Um, the second thing we needed to do was actually look at the affluent coming out of the wastewater treatment plant and try to determine if we could see a decline in the number of fibers that were going out through that uh, system. Roughly, we had 10% of the uh, households covered, so we thought we should see something around that magnitude. And like I said, it's only a single observation, but in fact, we are seeing a very statistically significant decline in the microfiber concentration going out of the wastewater treatment facility. So that's good news, and I think it, it does bode well for the, the oncoming uh, samples that we'll be doing and reporting on that'll show that this is an effective uh, tool in the arsenal of things. Um, we have uh, conducted 13 shoreline cleanups with the community where we had volunteers come out, many of them who were filter uh, volunteers as well, had the filters installed in their homes, but came out to the shores of, uh, of the sound here. And we removed uh, over 1,200 pounds of garbage in those collections, which is a lot of uh, pieces of, of uh, foam and plastic. A lot of what we're finding in this area seems to be dock foam. So at some point we'd like to come back to council and tell you what we're doing on the dock foam side of the equation and, uh, and some of the initiatives. We've, we've put a special committee together on that to try to come into the township and talk about uh, how we can avoid um, that source of pollution if it's a common one. Um, we've educated over a thousand individuals in the community, run a number of workshops and done uh, a lot of outreach and presentations as well as in the surrounding uh, cottage communities. And we've, uh, we're really quite uh, happy with the results to date and we're continuing to actually push forward with uh, some recommendations that we'd like to make to all levels of government, even the provincial and federal governments, but to look at actually continuing to pursue the installation of these filters by the manufacturer in the product when they make it, instead of relying on individual householders to add it aftermarket because there's uh, some significant costs in adding the filter, putting the plumbing in place and making that installation happen too. So it'd be nice if the manufacturers were somehow mandated uh, to put the filters right in the machines as in fact they used to be back in 1950s, 60s, 70s and then they got taken out because they wanted to save uh, money on each machine, right? So that, that's a, an up, a very quick update on the microfibers uh, project. And what's kind of grown out of that is uh, the second opportunity that's starting to get a lot of um, attention around Georgian Bay right now, and that's this product called a C-bin. And I'll pull up the little brochure so you can see it. I think you have the materials too, but effectively this is like a big uh, pool skimmer that is installed, uh, attached to a dock, um, and it is powered, so there's a pump in it that just pulls water through, and the filter unit just traps material, so it's like creating a little bit of a, a funnel towards the filter by the pump circulating the water out, and it'll trap uh, anything that's floating up uh, or in the near surface water. It won't suck things right out of the bottom of the water, but anything that's kind of floating around the top including oil sheen. It's not an oil skimmer, but oil sheens that you might get in, uh, you know, vicinities of marinas or, or public docks, town docks, um, by putting uh, an actual, you know, 3M oil trapping sock just in the unit itself, it'll actually be able to take that uh, sheen off the water. Um, this project kind of started because we were approached by the town of Collingwood uh, to work with them on some type of similar project to the project that we implemented in Georgian Bay with the washing machines. So as we discussed in our original presentation at Council and with your enthusiastic support of the project, this is growing. The interest that was generated in Perry Sound by the participation of the town here has been seen by other municipalities and they're interested in participating too. And one of the things that the town of Collingwood wanted to do is look at their um, public uh, uh, port space where they have uh, kids out rowing, uh, some rowing clubs and things like that. 
the current mayor of Collingwood was an Olympic rower and had a nice affinity to being in the water and, and rowing with kids. And the kids were out one morning and there was this oil on the oil sheen on the water and it was smelled funny and bad and he just didn't like the idea of the kids kind of being exposed to that as they were uh, exercising. So uh, the technology was designed by two surfers in New Zealand, but it's now gone around the world. They, they raised a lot of money on one of these uh, social media uh, money sites. And, and now the technology is proven and installed, and there's a number of marinas in Georgian Bay that are purchasing this uh, technology. But we'd like to try to see seize on the educational opportunity that it presents, and that is if you can imagine down at the uh, town uh, dock or the pier, um, having some educational signage about the water and things you shouldn't be putting in the water or how you shouldn't be throwing garbage on the street because that eventually washes into the storm sewer and goes right out into the bay or your plastic water bottles, whatever it is. There's lots of educational opportunities around how people connect directly to the water and how their behavior can actually adversely impact it, as well as the fact that the unit would be sitting there and actually working and actually removing plastic from the water. Um, so they're fairly expensive to purchase. So what we are, are doing is actually, as we did before with the other plastics project, we're putting an application for funding in to a variety of funders. And we'd like to ask the town for a letter of support that we can attach to our applications when we go looking for money to purchase these. Um, part of that support, we would ask, and this is where the town of Collingwood has uh, come in too, is um, in providing the operational uh, management of the unit. So staff would be going out and emptying it. Um, the electricity provided for it would be provided through the town or the, the town's property. So that uh, our organization would uh, help with the capital acquisition, um, installation, signage, marketing, any of the kind of materials that are prepared for it. But the town would undertake kind of the ongoing operations of that as an in-kind type of expense. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that uh, we would ask for is that in making this, uh, uh, the public aware of water quality and, and this particular uh, device is that uh, the town's communication tools, newsletters and things like that perhaps could include some articles or discussions of this uh, as well. So initially, we're not asking for any capital uh, commitments. We'd like to go and, and try to uh, exhaust our way through the funds and try to, to get that capital um, acquired through our ability as a charity to raise that money, which we would be able to match to, by the way. Um, but if that was not successful, and at some point in the future we were unable to get uh, the money for it and the town did have some interest, we would appreciate the opportunity to come back to council and talk about possibly putting uh, one or more of these devices on the capital budget. So, but at this time, that's not the request that we're making. Um, this is an opportunity, I think, for uh, an organize like multiple partnerships to clean up certain areas of the watershed or provide this opportunity for public education. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you. Any questions from councillors? Councillor Borneman. So, uh, someone who wants to sign up for your micro filter project, where do they go to get the information that's required? They can go to our website or they can simply send an email to info at gbf.org, Georgian Bay Forever, and we'll be happy to provide them with all the information that they need. They don't like say I've had one in the basement for six months or something and it's not intrusive. There's no uh, no issue, no power. If water out of your washing machine just drains through this yeah. thing. It's pretty rudimentary. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, just uh, one of the, some questions that I know in discussions with staff that uh, I've had. Uh, we are just wondering. Um, just in regards to the actual effectiveness of these devices and um, you know, uh, could these be doing more harm than good if we neg negatively impact microorganisms and phytoplankton? 
You can so speak about the, that. So the filter pore size of these would not trap uh, microorganisms. It would trap things like leaf litter, uh, macroscopic plants, like big leaves, things like that that might be floating. But things like algae and so on would, uh, would flow right through. Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, you spoke about uh, private businesses on Georgian Bay. Are there any businesses, um, neighboring uh, uh, commun municipalities or in, in Perry Sound that are using these sea bins? Yeah, so these are the technology I saw at the boat show in January for marinas that had them in their displays, um, but that haven't installed them in the water yet because they need to be after the ice goes out. These, by the way, would have to come out uh, in the winter also. But uh, um, some marinas up in uh, Point O'Barrow, uh, they're putting two units in. Uh, the City of Toronto is putting 10 units in its port. Um, we're talking to Collingwood. We're also talking to the Township of the Archipelago, mm -hmm. who might be interested in putting it at a Point Pleasant, uh, their marina. But they're looking at a couple of sites in the Township of the Archipelago, uh, Archipelago potentially, too. So, yeah. Okay. And it's, this will be the first year any are installed anywhere in this area. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next item six, uh, Mayor and Councillor reports. Uh, today we'll start with uh, Councillor McCann. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Um, good evening, uh, Madam uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, Council, and uh, the public. Wednesday, February 26, I attended the Belvedere Heights Board of Management monthly meeting. Financial statements uh, were presented. We approved our budget for 2020, and we're moving uh, forward with our application for additional beds. And in 2020, Belvedere is focusing on a quality improvement plan to engineer teamwork and uh, communication and to involve uh, consistently assigned personal support workers uh, in care plan meetings. We're also investigating new software uh, to uh, help us manage our reports uh, for the uh, ministry and, and other uh, necessities. Uh, a system called Point Click Care, which is a cloud-based uh, uh, system, so we're still looking at that. Uh, there's also a reinstatement of the Belvedere Heights newsletter with plenty of photos and interesting reading, and uh, just contact the office about getting uh, your copy. Uh, Thursday evening here in Council Chambers then I attended a special Town Council uh, meeting for the purpose of discussing the 2020 budget. That was of course on the 27th. And uh, one other item, and I, I, I should have mentioned this uh, at our last uh, regular Council meeting and I, uh, I failed to and I, I'd like to take this opportunity now even though it's been a few weeks, but I wanted to extend uh, uh, condolences to the family of Ron Beckett who passed away February 5th. Uh, he was 75. Ron was well known in the community. He uh, did local radio advertising sales since the 1980s when the station was CFBQ and then CKLP and, and then the Moose. Uh, prior to media sales, he was in wholesale here in town at the former Gregory and Greek uh, business. Uh, through Kinsman and various volunteer efforts, Ron was a pillar of the community and he certainly will be missed. So condolences to, uh, to his family. I had an opportunity to work with him for a number of years. Uh, a great guy. Uh, so condolences indeed. And that is my report. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Keith. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Deputy uh, Mayor, fellow councillors, staff, and the public. My report will be short. I spent the day uh, attending a round table discussion uh, in reference to the Police Service uh, Boards Act, the changes in the Act, and uh, getting information from other municipalities and providing uh, comments because they're at the point of looking at policy and um, developing it in reference to legislation. So that was uh, very interesting and informing. Um, 
to uh, me as I'm sure to other municipalities. And uh, also I just uh, hope that last week on Wednesday, a few people uh, wore pink to um, certainly send a message about anti-bullying and being against it. I know I wore pink, but uh, I wore it for that reason, but also I like the color, so that's it. Thank you. Councillor Borneman. Uh, good evening, uh, your deputy worship. On the 26th, Councillor McCann mentioned the Belvedere uh, Heights uh, board meeting. I'd only add that the uh, the budget that was passed uh, sees no increase in the municipal levy for 2020, the first time that that's been managed in several years. Uh, a number of steps, as Councillor McCann indicated, are, are being taken to uh, uh, stabilize the finances at that institution. I think chief amongst them looking for increased partnerships with the West Prairie Sound Health Centre and Lakeland and the three-year plan to create additional beds resulting in additional revenues. On the 27th I attended a session that Lakeland Power hosted at the uh, Perry Sound Public Library with respect to uh, it's called affordability fund. It's mandated through the province. Uh, Lakeland isn't doing this altruistically. Uh, they're required to uh, provide information to all about uh, measures that can be taken to mitigate your power bills. Uh, I had conversation with Mr. Pengra that afternoon. We discussed this with Lakeland staff and hopefully future sessions will be made more widely aware and the town's website will be utilized to inform the public. Uh, I can't see any other way that increase will be uh, and uptake will be resulted. And as others have mentioned, I attended the uh, budget meeting on February 27th. I want to thank uh, our staff, commend our staff, particularly uh, Ms. Phillips and Ms. Gilbert for their efforts in the, the work that was presented. It was concise and understandable presents a realistic plan for the town in the upcoming years. I was uh, thinking back to when I first came here when budget meetings used to go on forever and it was a virtual Christmas catalog of projects that various people had uh, proposed. Uh, what's presented now is far more doable and, and takes into account the best interests of the community. So I, I thank our uh, folks for putting that together. And that's my report. Thank you. Um, well, I have a very short uh, report tonight because I will defer my OGRA report uh, from the conference that I attended last week uh, to the next meeting. Um, however, I did uh, attend the special budget meeting and um, I'd like to thank staff for their hard work and uh, um, I'd also like to uh, just comment about uh, some of the um, amazing hockey that is going on uh, in our community. Uh, we had um, our, I guess it would be Hall Construction Pee Wees uh, move on to the next uh, series in the rep uh, hockey as well as our local league, um, both Bantam and Midget. Um, played last weekend at the Bobby Orr Community Center and uh, both home teams uh, for both divisions were successful and champions in those tournaments and uh, just like to congratulate everyone and moving forward that there will be a lot of activity at the Bobby Orr Community Center this weekend with the midget MPS playoffs and I just encourage everyone uh, to get out and, uh, and support our youth. Thank you. Oh, and uh, uh, Mr. Harris will speak on behalf of uh, Mayor McGarvey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the mayor sends his regrets. He's uh, meeting with the uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities out of town. He uh, did want to mention, though, he participated in the February 21st and 22nd uh, 6th Annual Curdler's Care Bond Spiel in Perry Sound. And the importance there is that it raised $11,000 for veterans and their families. And just over 3,000 was raised for the District Land Ambulance Service. Uh, and he particularly wanted to thank uh, Mr. Ray Pavlov and Tom Traversy for their uh, organization of this event. And I think um, he indicates here that uh, these two individuals were responsible for creating this event and now it's spread to other communities across Ontario. So 
just expressing our thank you to, for their efforts in raising that kind of money. That was it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McCann, uh, we'll move to item uh, 8.1, public health funding, and I'll call Councillor McCann, uh, if you could please take the chair. Okay then, so um, moved by Councillor Borneman and seconded by Councillor Keith that uh, Council of the Corporation of the Town of Perry Sound supports the Township of Strong's resolution requesting that public health be funded through regular provincial taxation, not municipal property taxation per the following. Whereas the North Bay Perry Sound District Health Unit has advised municipalities of the following changes in the funding formula. Uh, change from 2575 municipal provincial to 3070 for mandatory programs and change from 100% provincial funding to 3070 for a number of other uh, related programs. And whereas these changes will result in a 42% increase in the municipal levy commencing in 2021 with no increased service delivery. And whereas small rural Northern Ontario municipalities did not have the financial resources to fund this 42% increase due to sparse populations and small tax bases making it difficult to raise the uh, requisite funds and also provide core mandated municipal services uh, to residents. And residents' annual income being well below the provincial poverty level with many or fixed incomes or many on fixed incomes and raising municipal property taxes will create significant hardship. Hence, the town of Perry Sound states that it requests the corporation remain under the auspices of the North Bay Perry Sound District Health Unit and under the rural and northern Ontario designation. And whereas the province of Ontario is currently reviewing the mandate and operations of public health units, Therefore, be it resolved that the Town of Perry Sound requests that Jim Pine, a facilitator of the Perry Sound Health Modernization Consultations, review the current funding formula for public health and rural and northern Ontario municipalities, proposing exemptions for the province to implement for 2021. And that the Town of Perry Sound contends that Perry Sound Health, as a pillar of the Ontario health care system, be funded through regular provincial taxation, not municipal property taxation, and further that this resolution be distributed to all 22 municipalities in the District of Perry Sound for endorsement with copies forwarded to the Ministry of Health, Minister of Long-Term Care, MPP Norm Miller, MPP Vic Patelli, Ontario Health Board Chair, uh, Phnom Chair, uh, Noma Chair and uh, AMO Chair and the North Bay Perry Sound District Health Unit. Discussion? Uh, all in favor? Carried. Okay, item nine point one point one. Water and wastewater <coughs> rate study. Um, Ms. Phillips, um, before considering the direction, is there any further information you'd like to provide? <coughs> Thank you, Madam De Deputy Mayor. <coughs> so, Council previously uh, directed staff um, to come back with water and wastewater rates that would change the current water and wastewater structure to a rate structure with a a monthly fixed charge based on meter size and a consumptive rate that is uniform for all customers. Um, at the September 3rd, 2019 uh, meeting, Council approved the initi initiation of a water and wastewater rate study. The preliminary results of the study are positive, indicating only inflationary increases would be um, required for 2021 to 2029 at 2%. Uh, 
And um, initial, initial calculations demonstrate that a change from one pricing structure to another, uh, as previously directed, would uh, result in different impacts to different types of users, as indicated in the report. Uh, so given the substantial impacts to residential customers required, staff recommend uh, deferring a pricing structure change to explore uh, other pricing structure options and to continue with the previously approved rates for 2020 uh, and return with updated rates for 2021 forward. And the final results of the study. Any questions? Okay, moved by Councillor Keith, uh, second by Councillor Borneman, whereas the water and wastewater rates enacted by bylaw 2012-6091 for the year 2020 are expected to adequately recover necessary operating and capital bill related expenditures for water and wastewater in 2020. Now therefore, Council hereby confirms the water and wastewater rates as enacted by bylaw 2012-6091 for 2020 and further, that pricing structure changes be deferred for a staff report and recommendation on additional pricing structures for consideration of updated rates for 2021. All in favor? Carried. Item 912, Tender Award, New Reception Desk. So, uh, uh, Ms. Phillips, if you'd yeah. like to speak, thank you. Okay, so uh, upon the recommendation of Brenda Ryan, Bad Architects, uh, staff recommend Council award the tender for the new reception desk to CFC Contracting, which is the lowest tender at uh, $51,939 plus HSD. This is a below budget. Uh, uh, a a cross-functional team uh, was created to navigate through the design, from the design to the advertisement of the tender. And uh, initial uh, front counter needs for staff and customers were developed by seeking staff input through surveys and feedback, which was sought throughout the design process. Uh, construction would be expected to begin in mid-April and substantial completions targeted at early May 2020. Are there any questions? Any questions, councillors? Councillor Mc... uh, Councillor Keith. Thank you. Uh, yes, my question has to do with uh, while the uh, reconstruction this redesign is occurring because we also know that we know the importance of safety but how are things going to function are we are we still for business being able to conduct business or are we shutting down the place uh yes so uh through you madam deputy mayor uh during the construction uh, a temporary service desk will be set up at the town so one of the options that staff are considering is to serve residents at the Gibson Street uh, entrance. Uh, a group of staff has been assembled to develop a solution on site and those service cha changes will be communicated to the public by way of a website and social media once um, they're determined, like the final uh, service counter details are determined, yes. Well, I've heard, thank you. Well, I've heard about how we're going to use the grand computer, but will I assume there will also be signs for people who don't have a computer so they'll know where to go, what door to go in, so to speak? Yes, so uh, we'll post signs on all of the entrances of the building so that people will know um, uh, where to go for service. Yes. Uh, Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you. Uh, so a comment and a question. Uh, the, uh, the contractor, CFC Contracting, I understand they've done some work for us at the uh, Bobby Orr Hall of Fame, uh, and we're pleased with their work? Uh, yes, so uh, th through um, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, we, we have inquired with the Bobby Orr Hall of Fame staff, and, and they're satisfied completely with the the work done during their um, display redesign down there. 
So my comment is, I'm, uh, in looking at the diagrams uh, and the drawings, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that the uh, uh, that that new installation will make good use of the uh, the uh, the space in, in the front office. Uh, once the, that one particular desk behind uh, the uh, reception desk was removed, you've got a wide open space there, a lot of wasted space. So this makes good use of that. And I think uh, this is the beginning of, of uh, developing a more secure uh, entrance uh, for the uh, uh, town office. I think we've had some incidents in the past that, uh, that have proven that we must protect our staff. And uh, not only those at the front desk, but uh, those throughout the whole building. So I'm glad to see this. Any questions, Councilor Borna? No. Um, I'd just like to say, um, as being present in the building one day when um, someone came in with a parking ticket um, and having seen what our staff had to uh, deal with, uh, I'm very pleased and supportive of this as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moved by Councillor Keith, second by Councillor Borneman, that upon recommendation of Brenda Ryan Fad Architects, Council award the tender for the new reception desk front counter redesign to CFC Contracting Inc. in the amount of $51,939 plus HST, this tender being the lo lowest of three tenders received. Item 9-3, oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> oh, there we go, um, yes, all in favor, carried, <laughs> thank you, Councillor Keith. Okay. Item 9-3-1, uh, consent applic application B02-2020, P.S. Wiley. Um, manager, manager of Building and Planning Service, Mr. Elgi, if you can please speak to this, or do you have any questions you'd like to, comments you'd like to add? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, um, not too many comments I'd like to add. It's a fairly straightforward application where the applicant's requesting to do a small law addition and a reciprocal right-of-way. Uh, reason being there is a septic uh, bed encroachment that they're looking to correct. Any questions? Okay. Moved by Councillor Borneman, second by Councillor Keith, that a decision on consent application number B02-2020 PS Wiley be approved subject to a condition of consent that the retained lot ensure compliance with the zoning bylaw as a result of the reduced frontage or that the severed lot be realigned to ensure no road frontage is reduced. All in favor? Carried. Item 1031, site plan application. S19-05, Microsuite Properties on Church Street. Uh, before considering the direction, is there any further information you'd like to provide, Mr. Elgy? Through Deputy Mayor, uh, no there is not. Okay. Moved by Councillor McCann, second by Councillor, oh, any questions? Councillor Keith. Yes, thank you, Mr. Elgi. I have two questions. I just want to clarify. Um, with this site plan, it seemed to me that the garbage would be respond. The garbage that's there is that going to be the responsibility of the landlord in the future? And my second question is in reference to the parking lot, which is gravel. Is there going to be a designated area for barrier-free? And is that percentage above what is usual for our community? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, yes, the, there is garbage being stored on site. It will be in a fenced-in enclosure. Uh, there is a boilerplate provision in all, in all of our site plan agreements that say uh, garbage is always a responsibility of the property owner unless the municipal garbage policy says otherwise. In this case, it's my understanding that uh, 
the garbage policy for the town says 10 residential units is their responsibility to re remove it. Uh, that's why they've, they've shown it there. A uh, second question, yes, there is one barrier free space provided uh, for the amount of parking spaces needed. That's actually double the provincial standard, even though it's only one. Uh, it's just the way the percentages uh, lie. Any further questions? Councillor McCann. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. LG, um, Lakeland Power didn't sign off on this. They said they couldn't provide the infrastructure needed for the uh, proper upgrade. Is that a problem for the uh, developer? Uh, through your deputy mayor, um, it, it's not a problem. It's just they noted uh, that substantial uh, uh, improvements would be needed uh, and that they always request in those situations that be forwarded to the developer so that they can discuss what improvements are needed. Uh, largely, the town's role in these situations is we forward Lakeland Power's requirements or concerns to the developer. They often work out how to improve it in the end. Um, but then before a site plan agreement is registered, we always require Lakeland Power's authorization so the development can't get too far ahead if it can't be uh, powered. So uh, this stage, I wouldn't see as a problem, but ultimately the, the proponent will have to rectify any issue to Lakeland's satisfaction. Okay, hey, thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Elgy. Moved by Councillor McCann, second by Councillor Borneman, that bylaw number 2020-7020 being a bylaw to authorize a site plan development agreement with Microsuite Properties Limited Church Street S19 slash 05 be considered as read a first time. In favor? Carried. Are all members in favor of having the second and third readings? In favor? Moved by Councillor Borneman, second by Councillor uh, McCann, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. All in favor? Carried. Okay. Yeah. 10.5.1 confirming bylaw, bylaw 2020-7020 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council. Moved by Councillor Keith, second by Councillor McCann, that bylaw number 2020-7021 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council be considered as read a first time. All in favor? Carried. Are all members in favor of having the second and third readings? All in favor? Carried. Moved by Councillor McCann, second by Councillor Keith, that being the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. All in favor? Carried. Entered as part of the minutes of the council meeting held this third, third day of March 2020. Prior to adjourning, I'd like to offer the following information to the public regarding the next council meeting. The next regular meeting of council for the town of Perry Sound is scheduled for Tuesday, March 17th, 2020 at 7 p.m. and will be held in the ch council chambers. The chambers are located on the top floor of 52 Segan Street. Public access to the building is off Gibson Street. A special meeting of council is to council to deal with the budget will be held on Wednesday, March 18th. 2020 at 7 p.m. also in the council chambers. All regular council meetings are held at 7 p.m. on the first and third Tuesday of each month except January and August where only one regular meeting is scheduled. Regular and special meetings are live streamed and recorded. Please check news and public notices on our website at www.perrysound.ca for instructions to watch live or recorded council meetings. Prior to a council meeting, agendas, changes to the council meeting schedule and notices of special council meetings are posted on the town's website at www.perrysound.ca under news and public notices. You can view an electronic copy of the complete agenda with supporting reports on the town's website. Search council calendar and the date of the meeting. Contact the town clerk or make a request through our website if you wish to receive the combined agenda via email. The minutes of council meetings are posted within two days after the council meeting on the town's website. Your TV airs council meetings on Saturdays, 
at 9.30 a.m. following a regular council meeting for Kojiko listings, contact www.yourtv.tv. Thank you and good night.